McCarthy and members of the committee, I hope this technology is working and I am pleased particularly to appear here before you today with my good friend, Commissioner Barnier. Uh, Michelle, I'm sorry I'm not there with you. Um, this is my third time speaking to this committee, but my first under these circumstances, and I thank you for allowing me to appear via video. I couldn't be with you in person because a couple of weeks ago, I took a clumsy fall in my house outside of Washington, and the result of this fall was four broken ribs and, yes, a punctured lung. And yet, I, I wasn't able to travel overseas uh, at this time. I will have a full recovery, but as I was recuperating and thinking about this testimony, I thought about the persistent questions that my family and friends kept asking me. How did it happen? How extensive is the problem? And what is the healing process? And as I turned to preparing the testimony, I thought these really were the questions somewhat after the Barclays case as well. So, if I may, how did this happen? How did the LIBOR situation uh, come to where we are? I think it's three issues with LIBOR and other survey rates. First, and possibly the most significant issue with LIBOR, is that the number of banks willing to lend to one another on an unsecured basis, this is without posting collateral, has been sharply reduced. This is because of a number of factors, the 2008 financial crisis, your own ongoing uh, debt crisis in Europe, enhanced regulatory capital and liquidity rules, and even the downgrading of many of the large credit uh, ratings for the banks. I believe that for a benchmark rate for any commodity, whether it's for wheat or corn or oil, or for interest rates to be reliable and have integrity, it's best to be anchored to real observable transactions. It's through these real transactions between arm's length buyers and sellers coming together in a marketplace that prices are set and discovered. And when market participants submit for a benchmark rate that lacks observable underlying transactions, even if they're operating in good faith, they may stray from what real transactions would reflect. Like walking in a dark forest, it's easy to get lost, particularly over time. In addition, when a benchmark is separated from real transactions, it's more vulnerable to misconduct, as we had seen in the Barclays case. I think the second issue with LIBOR is that banks that make LIBOR submissions do so essentially without oversight. There are, rules regard, there are no rules regarding controls and firewalls and independent testing and the like. And also, there's no specific controls to prevent banks from intentionally or unintentionally herding together and reporting the same or similar rates. And I think the third issue with LIBOR, which is inherent in a lot of pieces of the banking world, is that there are inherent conflicts of interest. I think we should just recognize this, but there are trading positions that benefit from the submissions, and we need to manage uh, the conflicts properly. So then the question is, how extensive is the problem? Naturally, people are wondering this post Barclays. The case highlights, I think, this broader issue that the underlying interbank market to which LIBOR and URIBOR refer has significantly diminished. Aside from the Barclays situation, market data also raises questions about the integrity of LIBOR. I go into further detail in my written testimony, but in short, if I can make four quick points. First, there are two surveys of U.S. dollar interbank borrowing rates one by LIBOR that you know, and one more recently by the U.S. dollar panel of URIBOR. The URIBOR survey has been consistently twice as high as the LIBOR survey, so it leaves the question as to why. Secondly, there's a well-known concept in finance, I will try not to get too uh, detailed, called interest rate parity. Basically, it says that currency forward rates will align with interest rates in two different economies. But since the financial crisis, for about four years now, there's not been this interest rate parity. Whether we're looking at dollar rates versus the euro, versus the sterling, versus the yen, theory and practice have not been aligning. The borrowing rate implied in the currency markets is quite different than LIBOR, and this has been true for about four years. Third, just like stocks and bonds, short-term interest rates experience volatility. In the last few years, there's been a lot of volatility, as we all know. But in LIBOR, it's far more stable than any comparable rate. Further, even if we look at individual submitters, and even if we look in 2012, 
It's remarkably stable, and in fact, 85% of the days, or five out of six days, we find that LIBOR submitters don't change their rates at all. And fourth, as LIBOR represents unsecured borrowings, one would think that it should reflect a credit spread. That's the risk of a bank failing. In looking at the publicly available data for at least 14 of the submitting banks, however, just looking at one-year borrowing rates they submit for LIBOR and comparing it to one-year credit default swap spreads, they're not aligned. I believe this market data says something about the health of the patient, the health of LIBOR even today here in 2012 and goes well beyond the Barclays case. So what is the healing process, if I can continue the metaphor to my ribs? When the CFTC began to investigate the Barclays matter, the agency was guided by our founding statute, the Commodities Exchange Act, which makes it unlawful to manipulate or attempt to manipulate the price of a commodity in interstate commerce. It also makes it unlawful to knowingly publish false information that tends to affect commodity prices. And we did work, I think, very well with the FSA in London and our Department of Justice to bring that case. But these are the founding statutes that we have. And as Europe considers legislation to enhance enforcement authorities regarding benchmarks and Parliament considers its provisions, I think similar to what we have, uh, these provisions about false reporting, deceptive practices, and attempted manipulation have been very good tools to uh, here in the States. As we look to next steps, I believe it's critical that benchmark rates rely upon observable transactions. A rate that relies upon observable transactions is anchored by the reality of that price discovery, buyers and sellers meeting in a marketplace. A rate that relies upon observable transactions has a lit path to credibility rather than the darkness that we have sometimes seen in the LIBOR market. And a rate that relies upon observable transaction is less vulnerable to misconduct. International regulators and market participants can work to address LIBOR's issues of governance and conflicts of interest, and I think that we should. But that still may not address the fundamental issue that the underlying market for unsecured interbank borrowing has largely diminished. Thus, similar to a medical problem, which I've had on my mind with these broken ribs, the question about LIBOR is, can it be sufficiently mended, or is this a circumstance where it's better to replace it with a rate based on observable transaction? Such alternatives do exist, including overnight index swap rates and repo rates, but though they are different, and market participants will have to decide what best to move to. If the market were to move to a replacement, I think it's crucial that there be an appropriate transition for people borrowing, lending, and hedging based on LIBOR. Broad market input would be necessary to establish protocols and market mechanisms for such a transition, and I believe such a transition should be done smoothly over time to mitigate any issues for borrowers, lenders, and hedgers. Several international organizations are examining and recommending approaches, including the BIS and IOSCO. I'm honored, along with Martin Wheatley, to have been asked to co-chair an IOSCO task force. Um, and I look forward to our work together, and I look forward to learning from the consultation that the European Commission and this uh, parliamentary body is looking at. In conclusion, I think it's time for a healthy benchmark anchored in actual observable transactions. It is time to restore the confidence of people around the globe that the rates at which they borrow and lend money and hedge interest rates and set are set honestly and transparently. I thank you, particularly given the unusual circumstances of this video, and I look forward to your questions. Well, uh, thank you very much, Chairman Gensler.